Well, welcome to chapter five. Uh, chapter five is the last chapter before we do our first round of midterms. Um, I don't even want to talk about the midterm other than it will be that day right before our holiday break. But we'll worry about chapter five first. You'll notice there's a lot of sections. You took notes on a lot of sections. Um, but these sections also have a lot of visuals. So as always, I'll supplement your handouts with those visuals. Today, I want to just talk about in general what a merchandising business is. Um, basically, they sell stuff. They sell merchandise. They sell inventory. They buy the inventory and turn around and sell it. The inventory at Willie's is basically food. Okay. The inventory at Be Inspired are home interior based gifts, so to speak. Okay. So far, we've been talking a lot about service businesses. Like if I take a hair salon, for example, do they sell stuff there? Yeah, there's usually a couple racks with shampoos and conditioners and maybe nail polish and different things, but their primary purpose is that they're a service business. They, they cut hair, among other things. This now is more like selling stuff, and it, I guess, times well with the holiday season and the gift buying and all that business. Okay. What I want you to know is we're going to just talk in general today about merchandising businesses or people that sell stuff. We'll talk about how do we purchase stuff that we turn around and sell. Purchasing merchandise and selling merchandise is definitely different, and we'll spend a couple days talking about those. We're going to just talk vocab on this section. I'm not going to actually have you do adjusting and closing entries for this chapter. We don't have time. And I will introduce to you, remember how we had the classified balance sheet with lots more sections? Well, now we're going to have a more of an in-depth look at an income statement. So that's just a snapshot of our chapter. Oftentimes, you hear the word wholesaler, but maybe you don't know what it means. If we're talking us, we're the consumer. We're filling shopping malls and stores to buy stuff. The book more formally calls that stuff merchandise. It's referred to as inventory. Where is inventory? Like where do, where do you see the inventory at Willie's? On the shelves. Do they have more inventory than just what's on the shelves? Where else do they keep their inventory? In the back. Did you know Willie's has even an offsite location that they keep some of their dry goods? Okay, let's let's talk superior. Where do you see Superior's inventory? They have that kind of new lot in between the old Heartland building. They have some stuff there. But interesting to Superior, they're only working on current jobs. What you see being worked on, they don't have a huge warehouse. So they don't have a huge back room. But that inventory is being produced and shipped out right away. Okay. Where do you see the inventory at Heartland Motor Company? On the lot. Do you think they have some elsewhere? The vehicle industry is a little bit unique. Okay. They're not they don't have a back room full of cars ready to come out. They can get at cars pretty quickly, but that's not really considered their inventory and it's until it's on their lot. Well, who are the consumers buying from? These retailers. Target, Walmart, Willie's. You could even consider Superior a retailer a pretty unique retailer because cons consumers are buying from them, okay? The, the consumer is a little bit different for, for the superior. The customer at superior is a little bit different than the customer at Willie's. Ira? Yes. Correct. The kind of a two-for-one, if you will. Who are the, who are the retailers buying from? often in bulk from a wholesaler. Do we as consumers get to buy from a wholesaler? Not usually, 
Not usually. Usually you need some kind of identification that you're considered a retailer, like a business ID number. You hear sometimes of retailers, we're going to market. Have you ever heard that phrase before? Like I'll use examples from Sweet Lilies. I'm in Sweet Lilies a lot. And, oh, Jenny, we're going to market this weekend. We can't wait. And what that means is they're going to a huge, like almost like an expo type setting where all sorts of wholesalers are set up trying to sell them bulk product. The fun part about when retailers go to wholesaler market, so to speak, they can often bring a guest. And so that's really the only way general consumers are going to get into a place like that is with another retailer. I, I use the word bulk with caution. You don't have to buy in bulk, but what do you think goes up if you're not buying in bulk? Yep, the cost. If you buy two pallets worth of this versus one thing of this item, the one thing is going to be, oftentimes they give really deep price deductions if you buy in bulk. Our school, for example, we're not a retailer, but I'll use school for example. Um, have you ever been in the custodian room? There's pallets of toilet paper. They don't buy one package of toilet paper at a time. They're buying pallets of it at a time. So this is, as consumers, this is really all we see. We walk into a store, whether that store is bricks and mortar, like a store, or you jump online to a store, that consumer-retailer relationship is pretty big. But this is where the retailer gets their stuff, oftentimes from wholesalers. I want to go back track a minute. Um, notice the, the, how the word revenue has changed a bit. It's called sales revenue instead of service revenue. Or even you'll hear me call it sales. A credit-based account that makes the income statement go up. The key here with this revenue as people, as consumers, buy from the retailer, it produces what's called sales revenue or sales. Is that stuff, merchandise or inventory free? No. That brings into a new player. How do we measure our income then? We take a look at our money in from sales. I want to actually jump ahead a minute. Yeah. The simple income equation that we know so far, sales or revenue, which I'm going to use both of them. Oh. Sales revenue minus expenses has typically equaled either a net income or net loss. We know that. We've been running that since early on in the book. That's the simple income equation. Sales or revenue minus expenses equal hopefully a net income. This chapter introduces a very complex version of this income statement or income equation. I'm going to backtrack and show it to you. We take a look at our sales. Here, right here is the simple one. Sales minus expenses equal hopefully a net income. But now we're going to introduce a few more players. Sales minus cost of goods sold or what we're going to refer to as COGS. I always think of Cogsworth from Beauty and the Beast, when I say COGS. But sales minus the cost of goods sold. There's a lot of factors here on cost of goods sold. It could be things like what we bought from the wholesaler, maybe what it costs to ship, but we're going to talk about shipping tomorrow. Okay. Did we have to pay someone to go pick it up? Cost of goods sold is the total cost of merchandise sold during the period. And we stop and say that equals what's called our gross profit. I'm going to jump ahead and do this again. Sales revenue minus COGS, cost of goods sold equals gross profit
gross profit. Minus, I'll come back to that. Operating expenses. Got to pay to have the lights on, utility expense. Got to pay our employees, salary and wages expense. Got to pay to advertise. All of our expenses. There's more, but you get the idea. So gross profit minus our operating expenses. Then we'll finally equal net income or net loss. That really is the same story. It's just that COGS and operating expenses get broken down. And before we even get to the expenses, they say, stop. What's our gross profit? You know, if I'm selling a pencil for $10, Am I really making ten dollars on that thing? No, because maybe it costs a dollar for me to buy that pencil. Well, my gross profit's nine. It's a lucrative business, apparently. But then I bring that nine dollars down here, and maybe it costs me another three bucks to pay my employees for that pencil, and it costs me another couple bucks to have lights on. So let's just say it costs me three dollars to just run my business. I'm really making only six bucks on that ten dollar pencil. So I sold it to a customer for ten bucks. But my my true profit or that net income on that particular pencil is only six dollars. Because I gotta pay to get the pencil and I gotta pay for all the operating expenses that exist. This is the complex version. If I back her out a minute, here's the simple one. Say revenue minus expenses. You're going to hear me say sales a lot, too. It's basically the same thing. It's revenue minus expenses equals net income or loss. But revenue minus cost of goods sold. Stop. That's gross profit. Then minus operating expenses also equals net income or loss. Can you tell? Here's the simple, fin here's the simple income statement. Here's the, and I forget what they called it. Not classified. I can't remember. Now I want to know. Multi step. There we go. So memorize this. Know it. Get it ingrained in your head. And I'll talk a lot about it in the coming days. <clears throat> Notice what it says here. A service business doesn't have cost of goods sold. And you could argue that. When you go get your hair cut, they're using a clipper or a scissor. Maybe they blow dry your hair. Well, doesn't that cost something? Operating expense. Doesn't it cost to have that person cutting your hair? Well, operating expense. They don't look at it as a COGS in a service business. Yes. Yeah, yep, yeah. right, right. Now, right, right, good. Um, just don't be confused by the whole idea of a hair salon, the shelf full of shampoo and conditioner that they want you to buy. That is inventory. That would follow this longer scheme. This visualizes, and I believe this is in your handout, this plays out the... service versus merchandising, okay? But you need to know the difference. There's just way more steps to a merchandising business. They're handling more stuff. You think of a law firm versus Willie's, who's handling more physical, tangible stuff? Willie's. They unload it off the truck. From there, they've probably got to check it in. Then they're filling the shelves. Then we turn around and buy it. And then they fill the shelves again. And then the, the checker checks it out. And then the carry-out guys carry it out. I mean, there's just a lot of hands in the cookie jar with this merchandising versus 
you go have legal services, way less stuff. Basically, it's either cash or AR with a service performed. This might be cash or AR, but we've got to go buy it, then we put it in inventory, then we sell it, and then the cycle goes on. Oftentimes, merchandising businesses will have a, a just longer, it takes them longer to do everything because they're handling more stuff. The operating cycle of a merchandising business, ordinary is longer than a service company. Handling inventory is very complex. One business that does it particularly well, Amazon. You guys, I ordered something from Amazon Saturday, and it was at my door yesterday. Think about the amount of inventory Amazon has. Warehouse is the size of our school. Why are we getting Amazon stuff quicker? Because now they're putting up big stuff in the cities. You can order stuff in, from Amazon in the cities, you'll get it the same day. <laughs> One, I, it, I know for a fact. Like my brother lives near one of the big places and they can get stuff the same day they order it. Now can you go walk in and shop at the Amazon warehouse? No, you can't. So I use Amazon because managing their inventory system, talk about a huge job. And the book talks about two types of inventory management systems, perpetual or periodic. I'm gonna explain both, talk about benefits of one particular, and I'll read to you what the book says about which approach we're gonna use in this chapter. A perpetual system. What you need to know about perpetual, it's continuously being monitored. And you'll probably have to look in your notes for this. I don't believe I put much in your ha supplemental handout for that. What you need to know about a perpetual system is it is continuously being monitored. Very detailed records of everything are always listed. And as far as COGS go, it's every time we either purchase inventory or sell it. So every time we go buy something, COGS is listed. And every time we sell something, COGS is listed. My best example that I can give is a car dealership. Do you think the cars on that Heartland lot, they know exactly how much they paid for them? They better, especially as we try to wheel and deal and bargain a better price. They have a bottom dollar in their head before we even walk in of what they can sell that car for because they know their cogs involved with getting it. And if it came from a long way and it costs a lot to ship it on that, those crazy double-decker trailers that those cars show up on, okay, they're running cars all the time and they need to know a price that goes with that. So their COGS is in their head and they have a very detailed record of it, okay? I will also tell you anything that is based with barcodes are probably running on a perpetual system. Think about how barcodes have changed how retail works. Beep, beep, think about you, you and Willie's. All you hear is beep, 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 because they're scanning that barcode and it's telling their super value system that something is selling. Do you think in that barcode electronic based system, it's all tracked with the cost of goods sold with it? It is. What you, what the, the big downfall of a perpetual system that's continuously tracked is it's expensive. Barcode systems, tracking systems are very expensive. Um, delivery folks now have barcodes right on their hip. They'll 
beep them right in as they deliver them. Okay, a few of you are Willie's people. Dana, I'll pick on you a minute. Have you ever seen when stuff comes off the truck at Willie's? Never, ever. I can guarantee there's lots of handheld barcoding going on. There's probably barcode scanning um, from the shipper that it's coming when it's coming off the truck, and there's probably some sort of barcode system from for Willie's knowing what's in the back room. I can guarantee at Willie's they could look up how many cans of corn they have right now in the store. Are they doing that on a daily basis? Probably not. But the whole idea of a perpetual system is that it's continuously being monitored every time it comes in when we purchase it and every time when we sell it. Some pros, and I, I think there's a whole slide, but I'll write them down right now. Um, there's less room for error on a perpetual system, or fraud for that matter. When it's beep, 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 checking in, could I steal a can of corn very easily from the back room? They're probably gonna figure it out. Somewhere, someone, some beep is going to know that that can of corn is missing. So it prevents fraud and error a lot better. Again, what you need to know, perpetual systems are continuously monitored and COGS is every time we purchase or sell something. This is the way the book is going to want us to do it. And I'll read to you the verbiage from the book about that. Now another system, another inventory management system is what's called the periodic, sec periodic system. Unlike perpetual, detailed records are not kept for goods on hand, that is. And COGS is only done during the closing entries. If this is not in your notes, please add it. This big mass problem right here is how COGS is measured. They take a look at what we have at the beginning, plus any purchases, less the ending inventory, and then that's COGS. So what we have at the beginning, plus what we buy or add into our inventory, and then what's left at the end. It's kind of like, you know how we do an adjusting entry for supplies? Here's what we started with, and then after a physical count, here's what's left, what we used was the adjusting entry. That's very similar to this. What we start with, what we add to our inventory, what was left at the end, and the difference is must be what we sold or cost of goods that we sold. This tends to be more what small businesses who maybe don't have the sophisticated system like a barcode use. I'm gonna be honest, this is what Junk by Jenny uses. I couldn't tell you how many chairs I have right now. They're stacked up in my parents' barn. I recently bought 40 at one time, so I know I have at least 40. But some are junky, some I won't end up using, okay? So am I tracking every chair and every bit of paint that I put on it? And every bit of sandpaper that I use? And no, I am very much, for my side business that I have, a, per, a, a periodic system. I take a look at what do I start my year with? What did I add to it? What did I end up actually using? And then that is my cost for the year. I am not looking at cost every single time. Because what if I use half a gallon of paint here and another quarter of a gallon of paint there? I'm still left with a quarter gallon of paint at the end of the year. Those become my operating expenses. In my line of work, COGS is often free because people are begging me to take their junk. I, I buy some of my stuff, I do, um, but I don't calculate, I don't look at every sale 
or every purchase is worth cogs. I just use this. What did I start with? What did I add? And what it was I left at the end? And then figure out cogs from there. Do you see how this is a little bit more under the radar? Like, mm, how, are, are there 40 chairs in that barn, Jenny, or are there 41? I honestly couldn't tell you right now. I just take a look at what I start with, what I add, and then what's left at the end. Should I have a barcode system? Maybe. But that would mean me buying a barcode system. I have a little bit of a numbering system, but that's only stuff that's actually being sold, not what's in my warehouse. So this gentleman is going to, in three minutes, tell you what I told you in about 20. I am going to pause. So let's just take a snapshot one more time. I explained it. He explained it. Let's take a look at perpetual versus periodic. What's the big word that goes with perpetual? It starts with C. Mm, I spelled that wrong, but not sure. We'll go with it. Perpetual is continuously being monitored. Every time we purchase inventory, we stop and say, what was COGS? Every time we sell inventory, stop and say, what was COGS? Perpetual often is some barcode-based expensive management software that goes with it and, it, and it oftentimes is costly. But there is less error and fraud. Uh, no, it, it typically, it's all internal within your business. Like when I say barcode, it means there's probably some handheld device that maybe has a little tiny printer attached to it that shoots out a barcode, whether it's sticker form or like tag form, like a tag on a piece of clothing. Then it it will often read to some computer system where it's all managed right there. Um, does that answer your question? Sure. Um, is every barcode unique? To go back to answering your question a little bit more, like, could I go scan something at Willie's? Probably. And it's all that magnetic, like, infrared. Like, you think about a barcode reader, it's got those lasers that read it. Good question, though. Periodic is not detailed records, unlike a barcode that reads it and it goes right to some computer system. Um, Cogs is only at the end where you take a look at your beginning inventory plus any purchases minus your ending inventory and basically what's left determines cost of goods sold. Take a look at what's left and then whatever's not there, that's your cost of goods sold. Uh, you'll see small businesses using this more often because it's less expensive. These points are what make Perpetual a little bit better. And I want to read to you what the book says about this.
I'm on page 221. You don't have to go there, but I'm going to read what it says. It's in bold print. Because of the widespread use of perpetual inventory systems, we illustrate it in this chapter. So this chapter will focus on the perpetual way. If you really, really, really want to know the journal entries that go with periodic, it's in the appendix section of this chapter. But we are going to move forward. You need to know that per periodic exists, but we are going to focus on perpetual. So you're going to see COGS used a lot every time we purchase something and every time we sell something. That concludes section one. I would like to do a really quick set of five questions. So these will not be in your um, workbook pages. Perhaps you want to just write them on one of my supplemental handout pages that I gave, the responses. I don't think we'll have time for brief exercise 5-1. We'll see about doing that in the future. But right now, let's do questions 1 through 5. Um, you'll find them on page 250 of your book. We'll do them together. Tomorrow, tomorrow Thursday, we'll get into journalizing, both the purchase of a, a merchandise and then the sale of it. Question one, there's two parts. They're basically wanting you to agree or disagree with the statement. The steps in the accounting cycle for a merchandising business are different from the accounting cycle of a service company. Do you agree or disagree? They are basically the same. The steps are the steps. Remember that back in that last chapter, there's nine big steps. You know, it was this, and then we did this, and then we did this, and then, you guys remember that? It was a big circle in the last chapter. So they're basically the same. It's just the steps are, anyway. They have to do all the same steps. We have to journalize and post and make a trial balance, and then we do a worksheet and do an adjustment, and then we, it's all the same basic steps. It's just that a merchandising company is just more, there's more detail involved, because there's more hands in the cookie jar. Is the measurement of net income for a merchandising company conceptually the same? It is conceptually the same. It's just that there's a few more stops or hoops to jump through. Remember, revenue minus expenses, we'll just say equals net income. That's the basic premise. It's just now we're going to add a few more stopping points. Revenue minus COGS equals gross profit minus expenses, then equals net income. That's basically the same. It's just a few more stop, add a few more concepts there. Number two, why is the normal operating cycle for a merchandising company likely to be longer than a service company? Why do you think it is? Why is it going to be a little bit longer? More hands in the cookie jar. We first have to purchase merchandise and then sell it, and we have to go get our AR. So you might go back to question one and be like, where's, I thought it's, well, it's different. Well, it's the same basic steps as a service. It's just going to take longer, a merchandising-based business. Number three. 
How do the components of revenue and expenses differ between merchandising and service companies? And then explain the income measurement process. It's basically what we just did up there. What I did right here is basically number three. This is the complex income measurement. I like how they um, stop and say, okay, here's for a merchandising business, here's for a service business. Revenue for a merchandising business comes in as sales revenue. We're selling stuff. Expenses, look at cost of goods sold or COGS and operating. For a service-based business, the expenses are operating only. We're not buying stuff when we're looking at a service business. Service has a few more components, whether we're charging a fee or we're renting something or we're performing that service. So I like how those, I like how that visually plays out. And again, in that part B, it's what we already talked about up in number one. Number four is basically saying the same thing as number three. They're just asking you how does income differ between a merchandising and service business. Again, if you know that long income measurement thing, you're good to go. Revenue minus cost of goods sold, stop, equals gross profit, minus your operating expenses equals either the net income or loss. Finally, for number five, they're asking you about perpetual inventory systems again. Perpetually, or in a perpetual way, it's continuously being recorded. Cost of goods sold is determined every time we sell something. Instead of in a periodic system, it's only figured out at the end based on what we start with plus anything else we bought minus what's still there. That, my friends, is a snapshot of how merchandising systems work. We are going to talk about tomorrow how you buy merchandise, and on Thursday we'll talk about how you sell it. Cool?